Um, so nobody has. So what we can do now, uh, we're at 10, 15. Okay, so we've got like 40, 30, 40 minutes. Um, I still want to give the MR applications, MRI applications lecture number two, because I love this stuff. Um, it's, I spent a lot of my life doing it. So it's, it's really fun. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, okay. So can everybody see the screen and you see my slides? Okay, great. Uh, so again, this is what a person looks like as they go in the, the scanner. They've got a coil wrapped around their chest such that they get really high signal to noise right at the heart. And remember the transmission comes from the coil that's in the scanner with the gradient coils in the main magnetic field. Uh, you, She looks really comfortable because she doesn't have EKG leads coming off. She doesn't have earplugs in. You should have headphones on with music or you should have earphone like earplugs in because the sequences are really noisy. And just to review again, uh, when you send a transmission pulse in to take the magnetization vector from parallel to the magnetic field, you tip it down, the new magnetization uh, is regenerated with a time constant uh, that is called T1, right? So this is a very simple equation. It's a first order so solution to a really simple first order differential equation where, you know, it's just the same as like beer coming to room temperature, that kind of thing. If you put down a cold glass of beer, it'll come to room temperature with this, this kind of curve. So it's, a, it's basically thermal, uh, thermally driven growth. And then after a few seconds, you're back to the as big a magnetization as you're going to get. And that's the T1 constant. T2 is, as you recall, we tip the magnetization into the transverse plane. And in the transverse plane, it essentially, the magnetization dephases. So the uh, individual magnetization vectors uh, process at slightly different frequencies, and you get a loss of signal, which goes as... T2. If it's purely from external magnetic field gradients and sort of macroscopic changes in the in that magnetic field change the magnetization vectors on the sort of millimeter scale, this time constant is called T2 star. There is a non-recoverable decay of transverse magnetization, which really comes from spin-spin interactions between protons. And they become uh, essentially randomized, and they don't, and they no longer emit RF in a in a a coherent phased way. Um, but you need to explain that in quantum mechanics, and I have never seen a good explanation in an MRI textbook about that. Um, if you go to a basic quantum mechanics book, uh, you can see that explanation. Anyway. This time constant is how the stuff decays away with time in the transverse plane, and it's about 100 milliseconds, something like that. And in cardiac, when we look at those time constants themselves and how they're and what they look like and how they're measured, right? Um, we have a whole set of different types of pictures we can we can take. And uh, so let's start down here with this one. We talked about this. This is late gadolinium enhancement imaging. And you inject a contrast agent that makes the T1 get very short. And in those tissues where this contrast agent builds up over time, you have a very short T1. And if you perform a pulse sequence such that short T1 means it's bright, you get a really nice bright signal for the for the place where the gadolinium gets stuck. In the normal myocardium, it's it's washed out and it looks darker because the T1 has come back to a longer value. And you can see that here, the T1 here is short, T1 over here is longer, right? And you can make this map, which is, you know, essentially the underlying parameter 
that is causing the contrast. The issue of just looking at this image in the clinic versus this image <clears throat> is that to make an estimate of T1, you need a longer acquisition and um, you're susceptible to noise during the fitting of the parameter itself, okay? Whereas here, it's just relative brightness. And while you don't attach a great significance to the precise difference between this bright stuff and this dark stuff, you certainly see that there is bright stuff, right? And so as an existence proof, you know there's an infarct here. You don't know what its T1 is, but you know it's there. The T1 mapping is usually used for much more subtle changes in the T1 of a myocardium because of other diseases than, than just identifying how what the T1 is after a contrast injection. You can also make a map of the T2 value as a function of position in the myocardium. And we can see the T2 value of blood is quite long, right? Whereas in normal myocardium, it's whatever this purple color corresponds to. And then there's something abnormal happened over here. We saw from our applications last Wednesday that this could be from inflammation or from swelling when the tissue has, ha has been injured and you get sort of tissue swelling. T2 star is the decay of the magnetization on the macroscopic scale, as we said, from sort of local field in homogeneities. And you can see here, I'm gonna put the laser pointer on, you can see that T2 star is longer in the tissue than it is, say, in the blood, where there's a lot of motion-generated dephasing of, of the spins, right? This is a kind of a noisy image. Uh, there are some applications that depend on a good estimate of T2 star, but it's, it's a, a hard line to walk because what happens is if you get a really short value of T2 star, you have to decide, is it from just natural artifacts in my imaging system or is it the tissue? And there's a lot of ways to destroy signal and MRI with artifacts. So it, this has to be used with caution. And then you can uh, use timing metrics in terms of how the contrast makes the tissue change versus time and come up with things like extracellular volume fraction, you know, in the tissue. Uh, also, you can, because fat protons resonate at a slightly different frequency than water protons, you can um, disarticulate what signal is coming from fat and what is coming from water. And you can see if there's a deposition of lipid uh, in that tissue indicating uh, a different disease process. And so that's the fat fraction. And we, as we saw quantitative perfusion, this is where MR uh, beats uh, SPECT and CT and everything else in that you can see these perfusion deficits really easy when you look at the time of the, you know, the, the change in time of contrast as a function of time. Um, T1, as we saw in water, we have these long, long T1. So if I made my, if I do a preparation pulse, 180 degree pulse, and then I wait until here and I make my image right here, the cerebral spinal fluid will show up as dark tissue because it's no signal comes from it. The brain will be brighter and the fat will be even brighter than that. And that's how you use T1 to generate contrast. So obviously you can get an infinite you know, family of contrast curves there. Yeah. Uh, this is showing myocardial T1 changes um, in a patient that has chronic myocardial uh, ischemia. And um, here's a an area, say, of the tissue which is still alive, but is at risk because the blood flow is quite low. This tissue here, uh, has died. It's, and um, so ideally what you want to do is if somebody's come in, you know they've had a heart attack, you know it's ongoing, should you get in there and open their vessel 
with a heroic procedure? Um, should you do a bypass or should you put a stent in, et cetera? Um, you want to be able to identify whether or not there's uh, viable tissue distal to that uh, risk area or distal to that uh, lesion. And um, changes in, in T1 have also been uh, uh, linked to uh, more subtle diseases like uh, amyloidosis here, where we can see where the T1 of the uh, tissue ha has become higher sort of globally in the myocardium where a normal T1 map looks like this. And you can see the T1 values here like 974 or something. This is really reproducible from person to person, it turns out, like plus or minus 25 to 50 milliseconds. And so if you bump the T1 up to like 1100 out here, you know something's going wrong, right? Uh, this was the original vision of how MRI would be used in medicine, was that these fundamental constants like T1 and T2 would tell you that like this is car cardiac amyloidosis, or it would tell you this is a... Uh, cancer, uh, which, you know, is is going to metastasize versus a uh, benign uh, lesion. It didn't pan out uh, for cancer uh, because the things that change T1 just, you know, between two types of tumors, uh, it's, it's not um, selective enough. And then here's acute myocarditis where you have a region where you've got you know, this infection causing a, a really local high T1 value in, in the tissue. So those are the time constants. Uh, here's another picture of the way a heart can look post heart attack. So the person had EKG changes, showed up at the hospital. They now have this lesion. And, uh, you know, you have basically stuff that you can salvage, stuff that you can partially salvage or a complete infarct, depending on what your uh, late gadolinium enhancement looks like. Uh, T2 uh, is measured, um, or I'm sorry, uh, T1 is measured usually using multiple pictures of the same slice, right? Uh, most of the time this is done with 2D, so you select a slice and you and you take different pictures of that slice and how those pictures change as a function of what timing parameters you've given it gives you the T1. And so you'll take your first image with, you'll do 180 degree pulse before the image, take a picture right away and you get this picture, take a picture after 1100 milliseconds and you'll get this picture. And I do it again, do 180 degree pulse, take a picture at two seconds after that and you get this picture. And you can see you're mapping out these relative intensities and you can fit those to uh, estimate this underlying recovery curve and you get a T1 map. Uh, so you get sort of specific T1 in the blood and the T1 in the myocardium, et cetera. As you can see, these are seconds, right? This is one second, this is two seconds, this is three seconds. So this is not gonna happen in 150 milliseconds, right? Like a full-on CT image can be obtained in 150 milliseconds, which is like right down here. Right? You have to do this procedure and you have to repeat it many times in order to acquire the Fourier data to make this full picture. You can't get this full picture all at once, usually. It takes like, you know, anywhere from four to 32 heartbeats to, to get that to happen. And depending on the quality of the picture you want, so it takes a long time. That is a knock against it. You can speed the whole process up <clears throat> by putting RF pulses in rapid succession and imaging at a delay after the pulse and get this whole thing done, you know, in 20 seconds or something. And the brightness of the pictures will have a much lower dynamic range than they did in this technique. Everything's happening down here, right? So you don't have these huge signals to work with, but it's all happening down here. But these signals are coming out very quickly. And so you see the change in signal strength in the heart 
over a very short period of time and you take those signal amplitudes that you're measuring here and you come up with a T1 map. Uh, so this can be done in a breath hold, you know. Uh, so a, a patient can do that, or you can get that from a patient while you're uh, asking them to hold their breath. And then there's modifications of that rapid uh, T1 estimate. And uh, here's a, if you really want to get into this stuff, here's a very good uh, uh, sort of review paper on all these T1 estimation techniques. And uh, Peter Kelman uh, wrote it. He's a, he's a sort of world expert on this stuff. So uh, I think we're going to move on since we're, okay. So here's what uh, a sequence of 25 images looks like where we're taking one image per heartbeat and we do it over 45 heartbeats. So there's, we skip some beats, right? So it's like every other beat or something. And um, this is the sagittal view. Here's the patient's spine. So they're lying nice and, you know, quietly in the, this is a CT scan. This is the patient's chest wall here. And you can see it's kind of moving up and down as they are breathing, not very intensely, right? Their, their chest isn't going up and down a lot. But when they breathe, their diaphragm moves up and down, right? In order to change their lung volume. And so here's the diaphragm in the coronal view. We're looking from the patient's chest towards their back. This would be their left arm over here. This would be their right arm. And you can see the diaphragm positions moving up and down a lot during this 45 heartbeats. So this is breathing motion. So think back to SPECT, right? We had to take, we had to image over the course of like 20 minutes while a patient is in there breathing. So this is what's going on in that 20 minutes, right? And uh, this is all of a sudden you understand, oh, that's why it looks like a big old blurry donut, right? When, when the image comes out, it's because if you pick a donut here, it's basically getting you know, shaken around inside a, a fairly large um, uh, region of interest. Um, when you want to do myocardial perfusion and you want to acquire it, you know, during multiple beats. So say I want perfusion from this location here, or I want perfusion from this location here, I'm going to have to do some kind of tracking, right? In CT, you get these fantastic 3D models. So the tracking is you know, pretty straightforward. You just have to do a, you know, basically non-rigid deformation of this object to map it one on top of the other and you can recover it. In MR, here's some MR uh, perfusion picks uh, where you can, they're trying to get a T1 map in the myocardium. It's moving around. So they're going to map these regions of interest one on top of the other in some automated way. And you can imagine there's a ton of ways to do that. Um, so here is, you know, what MR looks like. We've seen these before. Um, I mean, I don't know why that didn't move. I want to show this movie because it's an impressive movie. How do I? Oh, there. Let me go back there. Okay, so the super impressive part about this is like the person's diaphragm is not moving at all, okay? And the reason it's not moving is because they were asked to hold their breath, okay? And so they held their breath for tw maybe eight to 16 heartbeats, something like that. And so you can see their chest is rock solid. It's not moving at all. The lung tissue is moving as the heart contracts. It's pulling the vessels towards, towards the heart as it contracts in. The liver is getting pulled up as the heart contracts and makes a sort of vacuum pressure. And you can measure these fantastic estimates of myocardial uh, deformation, right? During, during these dynamic scans. And in MR, you ask them to hold their breath again for 16 beats and you rotate the gradient so that now you get a picture of all four chambers in one view, right? And, and we can see the a normal uh, contraction. In fact, this is almost looks like hyper contraction, right? This is almost a bit too much. The person looks like they've been on a bicycle. 
Um, and you can see this fantastic kind of flow swirling of the blood coming in the pulmonary veins. Um, and this is a classic two chamber view with the atrium up here. And you know, so, so if we want to quantify the amount of deformation in the myocardium, and this is a big deal because when you have ischemia, a, a very local part of the myocardium can shut down its a cardiac contraction, the myocardial contraction. And that is a very good sign that that person is in trouble and that you should, uh, you know, address the situation. So here you can see the, there's some kind of artifact going on here, but if you put these lines in the heart with saturation pulses and MR at end diastole, they stick to the myocardium through the heartbeat. And you get this fantastic set of lines to track local uh, displacements and therefore local deformations of the tissue. And you can do this also in, this is in an animal model. The reason this grid looks so sharp is because this is a compendium of two grids. One is in this direction, one is in this direction. They were obtained separately so that you could increase the spatial resolution along the grid, you know, perpendicular to the grid. And it produces this ridiculous, you know, deformation field. And now you've got a, you know, post-processing job of going in here and finding where all these lines go or where all these intersections go and coming up with a strain field. And, you know, the, the one thing though, is that you ask yourself then, okay, if I come up with this strain field uh, after my analysis, what's the best way to visualize that strain field? And think, well, we could paint a Cartesian grid on the myocardium and watch the strain field deform the Cartesian grid. Right? And you're like, uh, well, that's what we've got here, you know, to begin with. So why don't we just use these pictures to make the, the call, uh, which is how this is used in practically, right? Is you just put these lines in the scan and then you can use the pictures to make the call. But if you're so inclined, uh, you can go in. Here's a, a, a paper that will tell you all you need to know about how to do this. So here's multiple slices, short axis slices through the heart. And here's the middle of the heart at end systole where we have these lines, right? You can go in, segment out those lines and create a model of the heart. This is the separation of each slice where these lines are. And you get the displacement in the orthogonal direction from a picture of exactly the same location, just taken with the, the markers rotated so that you get orthogonal displacements. Look something like this, just rotated 90 degrees. And then you can get the displacement in the longitudinal direction by looking at, say, in this case, nine slices in which the uh, orientation has been rotated around, right? So you have many, so you've got 18 different, you know, walls here, if you count up all of the sampling of the walls and what the strain is in the orthogonal direction. You can use all of those data to invert, to call it, you know, create a 3D displacement field. And from that 3D displacement field, you can, you can generate 3D strain maps. And so here's a 3D strain map, probably representing strain that occurred at the mid wall shown on a surface inside the heart, right? So that's, this is basically the gold standard for how you do myocardial strain in a very controlled uh, situation. And you can get ridiculous resolution if you have time to get it. Here's uh, end diastole or the onset of contraction in this heart. Uh, at 40 milliseconds later, the yellow is represented the radial strain or the strain towards the center of the heart. So how much it's stretching in this direction, right? And you can see here, we've got a little chunk trans, you know, at the epicardial position that has been excited and the strain is higher. And here it's actually compressing, right? So it, this has not been activated yet, obviously. It's getting compressed. So you have a transmural resolution of how the activation of the myocardium is occurring mechanically, right? So MR is definitely the way to do this kind of thing uh, because especially in an experimental situation where you're, you know, looking at the effect of a drug or looking at the effect of ischemia or something like that. Um, but you can also do this in humans. 
The problem is to get this type of spatial resolution, the imaging time is too long for a human to hold their breath. So you have to sacrifice resolution to get it in humans. But when you do do it in humans, you can measure things like circumferential strain. And remember what that is, is like, how is the heart shortening along this curve, right? So from here to here, things get shorter along this direction. And when you plot that circumferential strain, you know, during contraction is negative. You start here at end diastole and the tissue gets shorter, right? And in this case, the tissue got like 16% shorter, right? And this is a normal subject over, and this would be end systole when the, the LV chamber is at its smallest volume. And then when it relaxes, it pops open. You can see the rate that it pops open is, is faster than the rate of it contracting down. It just relaxes and goes boop and pops right back, not to its complete volume yet, because it sits there in diastasis. Atrial contraction occurs and fills it, you know, an extra 10% or something. It's like a turbocharger, a turbo booster, right? So the atrium contracts, fills the ventricle a little more. So it stretches, right? This is a positive strain, like 4% positive. And then it starts to contract. So that's normal contraction, looking at circumferential strain. In a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, it looks quite different. The contraction is about the same rate as it is over here in the normal, but it stops early, right? And usually because there's a lot of myocardial mass, right? So that the heart is thicker, bigger, it contracts for a while, but it's it kind of gets stuck. And, and then the really interesting difference between a hypertroph and a normal person is that when the heart relaxes, it just has this kind of viscous component that it fills really slowly. This slope versus this slope is the parameter, which is the most sensitive to detect if somebody's going down this pathway, right? If their heart is becoming hypertrophic, if this relaxation rate starts to slow down, it starts to change from this, then you know they're probably going down this pathway. You still get a little bump from the atrial contraction, and then we start again. So this, you know, myocardial strain with MR is is really, really accurate and, and um, sensitive to these things. And it's also sensitive to local changes. So if you pace the heart uh, from the right atrial pacing site, which is the normal pacing site, the left ventricle, this map here, the color map is a strain map such that blue means, you know, highly negative circumferential strain. So here we're getting towards end systole and where we have a lot of negative strain uh, in the, along the whole heart. There's a little bit of stretch here in the aortic outflow tract. If you change the pacing such that it's a local pacing lead, and so let's look at the pacing from the RV apex. So we've placed a pacing lead down here, right? And instead of pacing with the normal Purkinje system, we're gonna pace the myocardium directly. We'll pace it right here. As soon as you do that, this tissue starts to contract locally, right? And the electrical, you know, depolarization wave moves from this location through the myocardium. And it moves at a slower rate than it does through the his Purkinje system. So you get a very interesting and desynchronous contraction of this ventricle. Here, this has reached now its maximum shortening or maximum contraction. And on the other side of the heart, it's stretched. This tissue has yet to be depolarized. So it's kind of soft or flaccid tissue and it gets stretched out. And then at a later time when it's depolarized, it contracts. And so this is really profound desynchrony. You can change the desynchrony, desynchrony locus or where it comes from just by moving the pacing lead. Instead of in the RV, you can put it on the base of the left ventricle, pace from there and you get this local contraction starting there and it spreads out and you get basically a stretch over here, you know, on the free wall uh, until it is depolarized and it contracts. And so these are all really well measured um, sort of predictable desynchronies uh, from pacing. And patients in heart failure often go into this desynchronous behavior uh, without this kind of pacing. It just the heart 
uh, has a defect in, say, the left bundle branch of the Purkinje system. And so you'll see these desynchronous patterns in a patient, like without a pacing lead. And the way you treat that is you go in and you, you put pacing leads on their heart on opposite sides of the heart and you pace them simultaneously. And then you get the heart to contract synchronously and the efficiency and the ejection fraction and everything goes up and they feel a lot better. And so that's called cardiac resynchronization therapy. It's a, it's a, an indication for pacing, uh, which has been around for about 15 years. Unfortunately, it's still hard to tell who's going to respond and not respond. So only about 60% of the people actually respond to the therapy. And so that's still an open question, open research. Um, first pass contrast with MR. We, we looked at this before, so I'll, I'll, this will be brief. But we, you know, you're imaging, say, one image per second, one image per heartbeat is fine because basically the signal is only going to change on a kind of heartbeat to heartbeat uh, time scale. When you inject contrast and you look at the at how the signal changes. And so this blue curve is the signal in the right ventricle. And so the injection comes to the right ventricle first, goes off to the lungs, empties from the right ventricle, comes back from the lungs and the pulmonaries and fills up, you know, the left the atrium and the left ventricle. And so the left ventricle peaks out here at some time delay. And then the, the contrast goes out of the left ventricle. And then the myocardium, as it goes out of the left ventricle and fills the aorta, comes down the coronaries, then the myocardium itself fills up. And the change in signal is much less than it is in the blood because the change in concentration is much less, but it's still quite profound and it still produces a really nice visible effect uh, in the myocardium. And, you know, it's, it's the way to do this. Uh, we looked at, at this breathing problem. This is obviously a problem in MR. This is CT data, but, you know, in MR, when you're doing this perfusion, people are breathing like this. You can apply a, you know, basically non-rigid registration to those pictures and produce these pictures as the output of that non-rigid registration. So now you have a heart that is basically registered in all three orientations, right? Uh, these pictures, you just pick one orientation and map everybody to it. But you can see what happens to, the, to some of the field of view outside. Obviously, the spine now is moving up and down, right? <laughs> which, you know, but you don't care because your region of interest is going to be drawn here and you're going to measure perfusion enhancement at that location of the heart. So this is a necessary step. It's kind of a pain in the neck, but you got to do it. So here's pre and post, uh, and you can see you would trust this a lot more. Um, this is a really cool application, which is real-time guidance of ablation of tissue with radio frequency energy. And we did this, this is a long time ago. This is like tw almost 25 years ago now. It doesn't seem like it, but it is. And uh, so we put a RF ablation catheter in the heart while... Uh, this is a porcine, like a pig, in in the magnet. And while we imaged, we did a lesion, you know, like a, you usually put, you know, 50 watts, 80 watts or something of, of energy at the, that comes out of this catheter and it heats up the tissue and, and basically cooks it, you know. And this is what is used in electrophysiology to stop, uh, you know, arrhythmias that are generated from a specific point. If you go to that point in the heart and you ablate the tissue around that point, that arrhythmia goes away and the patient is basically cured. However, they still have this lesion on their heart, like it's a burn on their heart. But to understand when you're finished burning, how big your burn is, et cetera, it would be great to visualize it. The EP docs, the only, they can't really visualize it while they're burning now because they do it under fluoro. Uh, they can go in and kind of map afterwards what, what the tissue looks like. But in MR, we could actually image it. This is a late gadolinium enhancement image of, of that burn. And you can see the voltage around the burn is reduced post-ablation. Uh, and you get this bright spot, which is uh, basically the uh, reaction uh, to that RF ablation. Again, uh, let me check what time we're at here. Okay, we're done. 
uh, we can we can pick this up on Wednesday. And because uh, I really want to show you this, this is really cool. This is if you measure where the infarct is on the myocardium, and you can do that accurately and with high high precision, you can feed this 3D map of this infarct into a, a large computer simulation. And so here's an infarct here, right, where the depolarization obviously slows down as it's going through the infarct. And then as you're pacing from this location, if you pace fast enough, you generate this self-perpetuating cyclical excitation, which is called VTAC, and which will evolve into VFib and kill you. So uh, it's it's a really nice way of of looking at the effect of of an infarct on a local piece of tissue. But we'll we'll uh, talk about that on Wednesday. Um, okay, everyone has. Uh, decided to go on June 14th. Uh, I put up the schedule. We are each going to get a half hour. I think we went a little long today, so we're going to have to like speed it up because we're all in the same time. But I think we have like three hours or something. It's like eight to 11. Uh, it says on the, the schedule. Um, I think it's eight to 11. Uh, but I would keep your, keep your slides definitely under like 25 20 something in there and that way we can uh, more easily keep on schedule okay any questions from the group on the lecture today or where we're going so we'll get back together on wednesday we're going to finish mr applications we're going to look at uh x-ray fluoroscopy uh and interventions under fluoro and um and then uh on june 14th we'll all get together again and we'll do the the projects uh, I will post up one more problem set that will be due, uh, say, after this weekend. Okay. Any? Yep. Great. Thank you. All right. Great. See you guys on Wednesday.